No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today I am here with the one and only Mr. Cartoon. How you feeling, yeah. man? What's up, Adam? I'm doing good. Great to have you in here, man. Good to be here. I feel like the mo one of the most interesting things about you to me is the fact that I feel like you are so early on realizing what being a tattoo artist was going to be, but you figured it out like 20 years before everybody else. <laughs> True or false? It sounds better coming out of you, you know? <laughs> That's what she um, said. <laughs> it, it, uh, it was something that, I don't know, it was just real natural because I listen to hip hop and oldies and I like tattoos, and, mm. you know, but when you would go to the tattoo shops, back then it was more like biker owned, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like uh, there wasn't hip hop on the radio and, and rappers weren't really getting tattoos when we started mm. out. But the homies, street guys were. Mm -hmm. So we were just doing it to like be cool amongst our peers, you know? Right. And tattooing is the most difficult form of all, too. But right. Yeah, we didn't really, really see that big picture at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. We were doing it more to uh, because we had to. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, there's always going to be that conflict. And I'm sure you've, you've had to go through it a lot of tattooing being the most mean, hardcore, not friendly to new stuff industry and you had a little bit more of a progressive mind state going into it right or at least you were able to sort of see what was coming down the pipe for sure i mean with tattooing those older ogs out they don't even want to see you doing a t-shirt graphic mm. they look at that as like you know maybe for the shop it's cool but don't get too fancy on us you know what i mean and right i never went to art school like formal art training but uh -huh. if you did they shit on you. Really? Was that, was, real that was looked down upon. Frowned upon. This was a... Tattooing was something that was like a blue-collar job. Uh -huh. You know? Uh, plumbers, maybe electrician, and then a tattooer, and then like a guy who paints cars. Right. You know, it went, it went in that... It wasn't supposed to... But when I got into it, I was already doing album covers mm -hmm. for like Easy e um, uh, Above the Law, Black, you know, Black Mafia Life album. Mm -hmm. So I was doing already... That's a Kid Frost album cover... So I was like, man, you get paid this in the music business, but the hardest sport in the world is tattooing, and you get the least money for that. So it just seemed like it had a long way to go still. Right, definitely. But, but the tattoos were dope, but the business side of it still had a long way to go. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting how different subcultures develop different like codes of conduct like I'm, a guy came up to me at my meeting in london he goes man you know there's a tattoo artist around the corner and he's supposed to be this legendary tattoo artist and i asked him to tattoo my face and he told me he wouldn't tattoo my face and we just looked at him and laughed like of course you want to tattoo your face you don't have any tattoos you idiot this dude's probably a, a somewhat respectable guy because he just saved you a whole lot of torment and trauma yeah and if you walk around with a tattoo on your face Every knucklehead is going to approach you mm. and want to know why you got that tattoo on your face. Right. So you probably saved him from getting beat up. And, you know, you know, I ain't got to tell you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like once the facials and the neck and the hands start getting done, you definitely attract the eyes of law enforcement and uh, knuckleheads in the bar. Yeah, that is a weird one because I feel like I've managed to avoid a lot of that. But every once in a while, I remember I went, uh, like three, four years ago, I'm just walking down the street in my old neighborhood in Koreatown and some freaking Mexican dude runs up on me. Hey, fuck skinheads. I'm like, bro, I got like some hair on my head. I'm not a skinhead. I had like, you know, this much hair on my head. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a skinhead, bro. Right. I'm just like realizing like, damn, like maybe I'm moving to the wrong area. This guy's trying to press me here. Yeah, those areas are uh, slowly getting gentrified, mm, but rapidly uh, that area. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you you drive through even Hollywood right now has changed mm, big time. Yeah, this was like Rebels neighborhood and MS is down the street. Mm. And, you know, still a lot of MS graffiti around here, but the cop presence is pretty hardcore now too. They're like ninjas. They're, they're more mm. hit out in the shadows and shit. I was working on a computer the other day. A dude pulls up and started jerking off behind a dumpster for probably an hour and a half. Yeah, that's gonna happen. Over there. <laughs> that's more. That's more common to downtown LA, though. Yeah, yeah. I witnessed, unfortunately, a lot of uh, homeless sex. Mm, we we're just talking about that. Yeah, but uh, once they get the erase your memory bank thing going, I'll take that part out. <laughs> You'll use that. <laughs> Please, Doc, erase any evidence of uh, homeless intercourse that I've witnessed throughout my life. They get horny too, you know. They do, and they got to get it out. <laughs> 
All right, guys, quick break to uh, show love to one of our sponsors. That is BlueChew.com. Yeah, BlueChew offers men a performance enhancement for the bedroom. If you head on over to BlueChew.com, one of their affiliated physicians will work with you to find the dosage and the active ingredients that will work for you. These things work faster than pills because they're actual gummies, uh, and they can be taken on a full or an empty stomach, uh, and the consultation is free. It really only takes a few minutes. If you want to connect with BlueChew.com, and uh, there's no need for an in-person doctor's visit. I know you've probably seen those uh, rhino pills in the gas station or whatever. Don't worry about those. Don't bother. Don't go to a doctor and find out about this real deal, serious stuff. Instead, just head on over to BlueChew.com. And while you're there, use promo code ADAM22 because you will pay just $5 shipping. And other than that, it's free, which is an insane deal. So go show some love to BlueChew, BlueChew.com, ADAM22. That's the promo code. Let's get back into the interview. Let me let me ask you this. You're, so you're working downtown for 20-something years now? Right. But where, where were you born exactly? And let's talk about the early days and mm-hmm. discovering that you had a knack for art. I was born at California Hospital in downtown L.A. Mm. in 1969. Wow. Okay. So it started in downtown as well. Started in downtown, and my parents moved to the harbor area of L.A., which is the uh, end of the 110 freeway. Mm-hmm. And uh, I lived in Torrance. I lived in Redondo, Gardena. Um, but I ended up my high school years in San Pedro, mm. graduated from San Pedro High. So that's a nice little southern california upbringing you get to sort of experience that whole sort of south of la yeah it used to be called the south bay now they call it the harbor area i live in long beach a long time so we were out in downey and san pedro and torrance and all those areas a lot you know for sure Mm. so growing up down there is good you know um you got white picket fence and palm trees but you've got housing projects and low riders everything's kind of mixed together by the water Mm. you know did you feel poor as a kid or did you feel like your parents had something no, I didn't know, you know, really how good I had it till I seen some of my homeboys and they were uh, real poor, you know. Right. I had two uh, middle class parents that worked a lot and um, they let, you know, with them gone, I went into the street. But uh, we had it pretty good compared to them. You know, my dad was always a hustler and had vintage cars. and But we were, you know, regular middle class Mexican family in, in Southern California. You know? Right. Did you find yourself or was there a little bit of conflict in your head where you're sort of like... I don't have to do this, but I'm so attracted to sort of the underbelly of this culture and the society. Oh, for sure. Like, you know, there was plenty of my homeboys that just played sports and never got into, like, gang life or mm. um, that culture. Um, I was attracted. You know, I didn't know the Fonz was doing robberies, you know, or, or, or carjackings and shit. The Fonz from Happy Days? Yeah. Like, I wanted to hang out with the Fonz in high school. Right. But I didn't know that. You know, they were gangbanging and shit. I didn't know the Fonz did that either. Is that in the show? <laughs> no, or it was just a San Pedro uh, <laughs> yeah. version of that. That you was the I mean? cool thing to do is that you were out here selling drugs or bringing in cars or doing whatever. Yeah, I mean, in, in the harbor area, you have two licks. You could be a longshoreman or, you you know, sell dope. So a longshoreman means basically you're just wrapped up in the whole union working on the yeah. dock type world. You're a union worker that makes, you know, six starts a six-figure year and uh, all the benefits and... You know, some of them become crane operators and get, get big bread. So you got homeboys from L.A. with bread driving rag and Paula's and right. having shit. And but, then the guys who can't get those jobs end up doing what they got to do to try to get that shit too, right? Yeah. A lot of jealousy in the mix. Guys that grow up together end up mm. battling each other. And did your you own th- people kind of. Did you think that you were going to end up with that sort of comfy job lifestyle? I didn't have any relatives that were longshoremen, so mm. no action. You oh, pretty so much have to have a relative in, in there. Uh. So, uh, but I knew I loved the lowriders. Mm. You know, I didn't uh, didn't like going to jail. Didn't like uh, you know shooting anybody or robbing shit. But I liked the the lowriders, the the fashion, the culture. You know what I mean? Like mm. the music, the girls. Uh, all, all the good shit. <laughs> and so you knew course. you knew that about your personality because, you know, you go through those phases when you're young where you're yeah. trying to figure out who you are. Sure. And, you know, sometimes I was having a conversation with my friends the other day. He was telling me, you know, I got a buddy who, you know, he did some big drug deal, a couple of kilos, whatever. Is his first time really doing any dirt. Mm. He's doing 20 years off that. So a lot of people don't really even get the time to figure out mm-hmm. what they are as a person. They might have been able to do that a couple of times and realize that it wasn't for them. 
Yeah. Some people don't get to learn that lesson right away. Yeah, exactly. And I was going to high school in the 80s, mm. you know, so um, gang banging was at all time high. Shit was real crazy. Your own people kind of preying on you. Mm. And um, I got fortunate that I, I love to draw, you know what I mean? And I would do graffiti and I would paint murals on the walls. And I figured out how to paint portraits of people's cars and shit, like airbrushing T-shirts. Mm. So I set up at the Rhodium uh, swap meet. I'll go to the Slauson Indoor, and I'll set up a little 10 by 10 and start airbrushing my tees. Were you so good that in your art classes in elementary school, the teachers were looking at your stuff, man, like, holy shit, he's got some talent? For sure. I drew for the school newspaper. Um, I'd get myself out. Like I wouldn't do any work all year. And then the teacher's ready to flunk me, and I'd pull the teacher aside and go, look. Before he flunked me, I, I noticed that everyone brings food in the classroom. If I draw you a sign that says no eating in class in a way that's going to catch their eye, your life's going to be easier. So if you give me that D, I'm going to hook you up. Like, just pass me. So I started to kind of learn how to use artwork. Wow. Not to so much manipulate other people, but to manipulate the situation mm. and kind of start bartering my artwork. And that's how I built my first lowriders. And started my whole company by bartering shit. Wow. But you were so good at art that it was like kind of undeniable. You know what? I found out that I love drawing at about 12. Uh -huh. And my parents were really cool, laid back. They're artists too. They can draw. Not professionally, but they can draw. And with their encouragement, I, I kept doing it. And, you know, I put in some years and I started to get good from mm. practicing. I think it's from practicing. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you got to have that natural talent, and then you need an absurd amount of practice on top of the talent, I think. Yeah. The natural talent part was that I liked art. That you I cared had, like, enough a to passion, grind. and yeah. like, I, I really dug it. Then you throw practice on top of that, and then people kind of, I don't know if you're born with it, or you can kind of uh, build it as you go. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because I've definitely had to work at it. Mm. So... uh Timing's also maybe what they call a talent, uh, uh, surrounding yourself by other people that are on the same path. And nowadays, I feel like the, the, the art thing has probably become a lot different because kids can go on YouTube and start watching tutorials <sighs> that could teach them all kinds of stuff super fast. Did you oh, have man. anything that you could really learn for it? Were you going to the library, get, get some books on drawing or something? I would just kind of look over shoulder mm. of uh, other graffiti writers or... My old man had a print shop. Like the, his business was that he made business cards, restaurant menus, posters, and that required artists to be around. Mm. And uh, he brought, he made a business card for a candy paint shop, you know, that painted cars. Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Hey, my son's in the art, man. Can I send him over there to hang out?" And he dropped me off at a body shop. And these guys were candy and Impalas and Lane Flake and Pearls. A bunch of real ass dudes. Yeah, a bunch of older men that were into mm. fucking candy painting cars and knuckleheads. And they just, I just was a fly on the wall. And you started shop. soaking shit up right away? I did. I, I fell in love with old school cars. And mm. I started to sweep the shop and, you know, um, made a decision that I'm going to commit myself to this. And mm. I'm going to have that shit one day. Did you do you feel like that kind of stuff kept you away from getting deep into the street stuff, or did you still sort of get into that whole? Oh, world? for sure. I mean, you know, I was in it. Once you kind of, you know, you, that's your group of friends. You're in it, but you got to learn how to survive through that shit. So, mm. my friends would be like, "Hey, man, we're gonna go to this party, and then after that, we're gonna go, you know, hit this liquor store. You down?" I'd be like, "Fuck yeah, let's do that shit." Oh fuck, I gotta go to work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I. I had got a job at a young age of doing working in the body shops and hanging around the art and shit. And uh it saved me mm. from being around the knuckleheads. And did do you feel like the the people that you were around because at that age it's very much there's a lot of incentive to sort of prove yourself sure. as being crazy, as being sure. willing to do some dumbass shit just yeah. to get a rep. Do you feel like they sort of looked at you as in like you got talent? Maybe you yeah. shouldn't necessarily be. They'll give you a pass on not. Definitely, I mean, robbing the liquor store. Definitely, I mean, my job was to write on walls. Mm. You know what I mean? That's what I was best at. I did just enough fighting and have to go fucking crack somebody, you know, and do this and that to let them know you're not some pussy or some shit. Mm. But that wasn't me for sure, because uh, I seen my friends going getting busted and, and start to do some time and. You go to a couple of funerals in between that shit, and you're mm. like, man, that guy was way harder than me, and he got <laughs> fucked up. Right. So I better stick to the drawing shit. I feel so you. So the tough guy shit's hard to be, uh, hard to win in that. Right. Do you, um, 
were you doing a lot of graffiti at the same time as well? I was. Right. And yeah. so did, did, did it stand out to you that there was a clear uh, difference between legal and illegal art? For sure. Uh, when you do illegal piece, your, your heart's going through your chest. Mm. And you got to focus on doing straight lines. And like what you do right right now, everyone's going to see it. Mm. So even though you're nervous as fuck, you can't let that shit show in your art or in your piece. Sometimes mm -hmm. it would just be block letters or you know, a tag in a bathroom, but regardless, you got to make it clean and you got to get off under pressure. Right. Then I would line up legit murals, you know, that I would trade a set of wire wheels or Dayton's for, and I'd paint a, their name on the side of their building, you know? Right. So I started to learn how to scale buildings and put my artwork in public and make it readable and legible. Yeah. And at the same time, KDY was a brand new radio station. Power 106 was still playing like, high energy music and uh hip hop at night. Right. You know, and uh I was like, how can I fit in to hip hop? You know what I mean? Mm. Um where where do I stand? And breaking wasn't gonna happen, DJing or rapping wasn't gonna happen, but I could draw. Right. So I just kind of dove into the deep end in graffiti. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. So so what kind of spots were you hitting doing graffiti at that time? And was it primarily just tags and block letters? Or had you even, had you got around to the concept of piecing yet? Well, L.A. and New York are very different mm. as far as graffiti goes. But we were definitely influenced by the bombing that was going on in New York. In the 80s, it must have been in the impossible 80s. to avoid how crazy the, the TV footage of the subways and stuff yeah. looked like, right? Exactly. Like, we'd watch TV shows and, and the trains would be trashed, you know, but mm. it's like... You you you're watching the Jeffersons or some shit, and he just happens to be in the subway, and you like you see the shit, you're like oh shit, and we couldn't rewind or pause that shit. And there was a Blondie video, Rapture, mm. where it has Lee and, and probably a Futura piece in that shit. first ever white girl rap video ever, I believe. Yeah, and it had real graph where Beat Street had fake graffiti in it. Mm. Like Remo did fake graffiti. He was dope. Remo was dope. But even back then as a kid, I thought that movie was the shit. Mm. Now as an adult, I look back, I'm like, the art department did that graffiti. That's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. like they could have got even the worst graffiti writer to do better. Right. But it, we were just happy to see minorities or um, graffiti or hip hop on the screen, you know? Yeah, definitely. It's wild when you talk about just knowing early on that it was important for you to do stuff like getting negotiated and somehow getting a mural that you could then use as a way to get your name out there. Like what was motivating and fueling that kind of work as a young kid? And what made you smart enough to know that that was important? Because a lot of young graffiti artists, they're super motivated to just go and do graffiti, but yeah. they're not thinking ever beyond that. It seems like you started to think about that almost immediately. Yeah, it happened really weird. I I got arrested in, in high school. Mm. I had two detectives come in and pull me out of class. And uh, they had been following me for, for some time, but I had two names. I had a graph name and a street name. Wow. My street name was Cartoon, but my graph name was Flame One. Okay. And uh, so they were looking for two different heads. <sighs> so that slowed them down for a minute. And uh, yeah, so I, I caught a case. And uh, fortunately, the officer had been to one of my father's birthday parties. And my old man throws good parties, and he's a real character, and everyone loves my old man. Right. He's still around? He's, he is, 76. Wow. He's, he's still, nice. he's got the Impala at the shop right now. He's working on it. So That's good. Me and my father are real tight. I bet. And um, long story short, that saved me when it, when I had to go to court and all that shit. Just having the two different names? Or no, him, oh, the, 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 the copy of Friends. Of arresting dad, officer, yeah. knowing my old man was good, you know. And uh, so from that point, I was like, all right, I'm not that slick as I thought I was. And I had to pay a fine. So I went and did graffiti <laughs> to pay the fine. Right. And I would go, I would walk up to boxing schools, barber shops, sound and audio shops. Anywhere that was kind of like would embrace graffiti, you know, mm -hmm. and I would try to do straight letters and put their phone number. And I even figured out how to do T-shirt graphics back then because uh -huh. I was like, you can make money with a T-shirt graphic. So you were actually making T-shirts or you were just doing the graphics for other people's shirts or something? I was airbrushing them by hand and I learned how to do camera ready pen and ink graphic wow. so that it could be put on a silk screen. Yeah. So I kind of taught myself all that shit by watching other people. I mean, I'm watching professionals. Too. That's just so impressive to me. Just so so few people think outside the box, and like so few people have that desire to just teach themselves things. Like, are you the kind of person that just gets a crazy amount of satisfaction 
from thinking up something in your head that you don't know how to do and then just tracking it down and figuring it out? Oh, for sure. It's like taking a, a, a 60, a 59 Impala that's a bucket and it looks like it's been on the bottom of the ocean uh -huh. and doing restoration on it. You know, acid blasting that, you know, soda blasting the car, take it mm. off the frame, powder coat the frame, and put each nut and bolt brand new mm. is kind of how I would do with other projects and um, being able to build something, I think, you know. And like thinking of your own mind that way. It just strikes me as like that being really the ideal mind state you would mm. want to have if you wanted to start to excel at something. Well, yeah, and it helps to see some people do it that you know. Mm. So I had a, a, a member in my crew named Risk, and uh, Risk had a company called Third Rail, mm. and it was the first time we had seen streetwear. Right. And this motherfucker threw a tag in applique on the front of a hoodie uh -huh. and had like a little embroidery on the wrist and a woven label. We were like, what the? And the woven label said like, fuck you on it or some shit like that. And we, we were blown away, man, that first of all, the homie did it. Second of all, he said, fuck you. Third of all, this was some quality shit. Yeah. And up to that point, street fashion in L.A. was um, our, um, Navy surplus stores. Mm -hmm. So you would go and you could buy Carhartt, Ben Davis, Dickies, um, and big sizes, men's sizes at these um, these shops. And they were met, they had like Swiss Army knives, a bunch of bullshit you didn't want, but they did have uh, Carhartt and, and thick ass raw denim jeans, mm. Levi's raw denim. And we'd go to JCPenney and buy white t shirts, and that was our, our uh, fashion. Right. And growing up in Southern California, you don't have to have layers of jackets and all that shit. You get one jacket. But see, seeing your friend be able to do that, like, you know, when you're at that stage in your life, even having a custom t shirt seems pretty cool. Nowadays, everybody sort of understands that it's easy to make a t shirt, but seeing custom embroidered stuff like that mm -hmm. must have made you really just be like, holy fuck, we can make our own shit that is this high quality. Yeah. And, and, it was because I seen my friend do it. Mm. So if he did, I know he's a knucklehead. Mm. I know I could do it. It gave me the motivation to attempt it myself. Mm. You know, how far with the art side of things do you feel? Or, or so you were when you realized that you could sort of take your art to the next level through hip hop. Like, what was that like? How did you decide to actually find a way to interject yourself into that scene? And who were the artists that you were messing with early on? Well, you know, my first introduction, of course, was. Uh, this in the KDY, and it was this. Uh, I would hear um, radio advertisements for Uncle Jam's Army. This wicked Uncle Jam's Army at the road at the the skating rink. You know there would be these crazy commercials, and it would be like Egyptian Lover was going to be performing, and they would hype you up. And so I was like, man, how how could I be a part of that shit? You know, and um, I I'm seen Easy E at a car wash in L.A. And I got all fucking shook. Oh my God, there's easy E. He's like my God. motherfucking height. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, what he, year are we talking when you met him? This is 1990. Okay. And he's chilling. Of course, he's got two giant Samoan twins with him. <laughs> and uh, I walked up to him and I gave him my business card. And I was like, What's up, easy? My name's Toon and I, I do murals and logos and blah, blah, blah. I gave him my card. He said, All right, man, good to meet you. And shook my hand. And, Kept it moving. Never heard from him. Uh -huh. Found out that he lived in Norwalk, where I had I lived at a time, and they go easy lives down the block. A little bit crazy. I got out my car. I had a mural on the hood. Knocked on his door. The Samoans answered the door. What's up? Was oh, easy here? Who are you, man? And I was like, I'm an artist, man. And I'm trying to talk my way out. Easy came out. Looked at my car. I gave him my little two second pitch. He said, Call me on Monday. And after that, I did the Penthouse Players album cover, MC Ren's first album cover, and uh, Above the Law. Wow. So that was, it was pretty crazy. But I was having to walk in and deal with an art department. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I started doing graffiti on TV shows. Mm. Um, my, my sister, you know, your family gets you a job. She goes, you're not going to believe this. They want you to go to Paramount Studios and just ride all over the walls, and they're going to pay you. My mom did an invoice on a typewriter. Got my old man's old briefcase through my spray paint cans and that shit. 
And I had never seen a craft service table. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> They're giving free food away. <laughs> There's a moment in your life where seeing the, the bags of chips and the free sodas and shit really will affect you a lot. Yeah, you're like, they're calling me sir. And um, I'm in Hollywood right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, my homeboys didn't even know how to get to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And we live like 20 miles from there. You know what I mean? Right. But uh, long story short, I just kind of had the confidence to go in there and, and do that shit. And I was like, let me get this straight. Just write my name on that wall. Like my homeboys' names were like, yeah, just have fun, man. Fuck it up. Uh -huh. And my homeboys didn't think it was even a real job. Right. They thought I had like a scam going, you know, that you're getting paid for writing our names and you do that shit for free anyway. It must have seemed so confusing then because to a regular guy like that, he doesn't really understand that the reason why you are in that position and why you deserve to be in that position right. is because of the fact that you networked your ass off and got into that position, found your way into that spot. They had no concept. <laughs> it's tough for somebody to understand that when they don't really, they're like, we're all doing graffiti. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd bring them with me and they'd start stealing food off of the <laughs> craft service table. And they'd be like, um, excuse me, sir, are you, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> they're shoving a bag you of lays in their pocket. <laughs> And then, you know, they start punking the PAs. Once they figured out oh my God. they could get over and that everyone's kind of soft, I realized I couldn't bring them back to, you know, don't bring your homeboys to work. Uh, you know, I guess is the moral of that story. That's a weird lesson to learn, huh? <laughs> Man, they go right, hit up the bathroom and shit. Oh, you know? my God, that's too funny. Hit on the intern girls and shit. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. But so were you at the time... Doing all the artwork for the different people mm -hmm. that you fucked with genuinely on a musical level, did that also kind of start to make you feel like, I want to do something bigger than this? Because you sort of turned to the tattooing stuff soon after. Was there a level to which you were sort of just not really 100% content with doing the album art and that side of oh, things? Oh, for sure. Like, anytime I get good at something, mm. I'm ready to move on to the next. So I'd already kind of uh, conquered some of that stuff and seen how the flow and seen the how hard that music business is like to chase a check and people are full of shit and this and that. I started to learn that also. Mm. Um, at that same time, I started getting tattooed and hanging out in tattoo shops and smell the green soap and motherfuckers getting sleeved down in there. You know what I mean? What was the tattoo world like at, in this year, the early nineties? Was it starting to really like emerge into his own thing? Is that the era that you got most of your sleeves done? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I definitely got on my, these tattoos in the 90s because the, the the game you know we, we think about tattooing having changed so much i'm just curious what stage it was really at at that point because this is before tattooing had really gone mainstream but it's maybe yeah. 10 years or so before it went mainstream mm -hmm. so it still probably had a little bit of that seeping through sure uh it was not jewelry yet mm. for now an nba player gets a contract he's gonna hit the jewelry spot he's gonna get his ride and he's gonna get tattooed because the tattoos they realize is the the dedication to to the culture. You know what I'm saying? It's it's commitment mm. at its at its finest. So, uh, but back then, it was more. Um, there wasn't a lot of brothers getting tattooed. Mm. You know, the Mexicans had full sleeves like the homies, but a lot of them were done by single needle by doing time. Mm. So, if you had sleeves, they would ask you where you do your time at. Right. This was the emergence of regular guys, working guys, getting sleeves. Mm. And a lot of them worked in the business in Hollywood. And uh, Ed Hardy was probably the biggest star amongst us. Right. Mark Mahoney was a big star. Jack Rudy, uh, Baby Ray, Bob Roberts. Uh, these were names that you would hear. Coyote, uh, Freddie Negretti. You know, the, these guys were um, famous way before the internet. Right. And uh, we're notorious. You know, Bob Roberts one time told me that he's, I asked him if he would tattoo my head. And he said, yeah, but only if you let me do the entire thing from the front of your hairline all the way sure. back, the whole top piece. And I was a little bit too timid to get it all outlined that day. So I didn't do it. That's, I probably yeah. should go back. Uh, to have a Bob Roberts headpiece is, is classic. That's you know? a big one. But those are the guys we looked up to. We were like bikers. You know, Freddie was probably the only Chicano in there, but mm. Jack Rudy had grew up in Mexican neighborhood and drew like a homie, you know? So uh, we were in there, but now if you look on Instagram, you know, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans are, were the 
pretty much deepest in that shit. Mm. And the art form, especially in fine line, black and gray, right? Now you see pieces coming, you know, Germany, France, and South America, and all these guys are doing amazing work. They're, they're doing it in places where they probably don't even know what it means. Mm. They just know it looks good. Do you miss that era of tattooing when there was more regional styles and it was more stuff was more specific to an area whereas now everybody's learning from each other online and it's, it's probably less of a you know it's like that in music as well it's like now you can sure. you could hear somebody from milwaukee and he sounds like he's from la yeah 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 i mean it's it's a time to reminisce and, and i'm fortunate i was there mm. for the end you know we even call it the innocent time because it wasn't so polished and perfect and you know there's reality shows now i have nothing to do with tattoos they're just hanging out in the tattoo shop and, mm. and arguing over their old lady and shit. But back then, you had a lot of rules and um, respect levels. So to open a shop, you had to ask for permission to open up a shop. To buy a tattoo machine, you had to ask permission to mm. do that. Um, things were definitely, everyone knew each other a lot better. But now you have to, hey, it is what it is. There's tattoo reality shows. You either embrace that shit or you get left behind. So we just try to embrace it and maintain the shit we learned mm. from then. You is know? it hard not to get salty about how whitewashed shit has gotten, how, how ridiculous, how commercialized it's gotten? I mean, I, I'm in the middle because I am in business. Mm. So I like that part. It I like grows, that. your business grows. Yeah, like I've turned down all the reality shows for tattooing because part of my success is I'm hard to find. Mm. And people don't know. They see an interview here and there, but they really don't know our day to day. So I wanted to keep that, and I didn't want to. Um, but those shows help me in a roundabout way, where it relaxes the masses mm. to let me in to do. Uh, right now, I'm doing the LA Clippers merch and Modelo, and a major. I got two vans coming out, so we have these like corporate gigs. But then to balance that. I'll walk into a school mm. in South Central and talk to a high school class. But it seems like you will go and work with these corporations, but you primarily make it about your art and not, oh, let me just go do a Nike thing where I'm for sitting sure. on camera for Nike for a while. No, you want to be able to try to um, translate the culture to, you know, other people that are in the same vibe you are, you know? In other words, I, I'm using the corporate company as a tool to, to forward and push forward the stuff. They're going to do it anyways. Mm. So they might as well have me or another street artist that lit, you know grew up here, let us do it. You know what I mean? Because they've been, you know, imitating and faking hip hop art for a long time. Mm. So it's a, but I, yeah, you can watch those shows and start getting angry, you mm. know, for sure. I know the OGs are fucked, man. They do not like that shit. Right. But it's going down. <laughs> It's a weird decision for you, too, because it's kind of like if you totally don't do any of the corporate stuff or you mm -hmm. never go on camera, you're kind of just opening the door for somebody who's a mm -hmm. commercialized, goofy version of you yeah. to come in and be like, oh, I'll, I'll be the guy who goes on the news and talks about this world or whatever, you know? Yeah, I, I was telling the apprentices the other day in the studio, it's not good enough to be a dope tattoo artist. That's just mandatory. There's, mm -hmm. Everyone can draw. Apparently, what I've been seeing, these motherfucking kids are dope. Mm. They take my formula and they're able to run with it. You know what I mean? And add their own shit onto it. And they're 20, so they got plenty of time to sit around all exactly. day. Exactly. Yeah. But that's even not good enough. You have to do that and be ready to be put on stage or a podcast and have to articulate the mm. shit and speak in front of a crowd and do these type of things. So that that's the way the world is now is that you have to have all corners covered mm. and i learned on accident right it feels like you for years and and to some extent still became like the default hip-hop tattoo artist where if you asked a, a rapper you know who you fuck with as a tattoo artist or who did this or whatever if there was if you were ever going to see a tattoo artist in a hip-hop context it was mr cartoon how did you get to that point of being that ubiquitous and just being around and just being known on that level? Well, first of all, I, I you know, love hip hop. You know what I mean? I mean, I listen to a lot of classic soul, you know, nineteen late 1950s, 60s and 70s uh, classic soul music. You know, I'm 
really me and my wife. That's that's all we listen to. But of course, uh, being that I am a graffiti writer, I have been to the East Coast. I, I'm a writer and graph writer at heart. You know what I mean. So I approach that in the art of tattooing with hip hop. So it was um, something that kind of happened by accident. I started uh, going on tour with Cypress Hill. Mm. And my boy, Stevan Orio, he was the road manager. And he would take me on tour and he was like, bring your tattoo shit with you. We'd be backstage for six hours waiting for them to go on stage. A lot of downtime as a rapper. A lot of downtime in, in the backstage. And you're in Europe and shit, so mm. you, you can't just go home or nothing. So long story short, I just was put in that position. Luck is being prepared for opportunity. Mm. You know, that's a cliche, but it, it rings true in certain areas where those times that you're practicing at home and no one's watching, that's the shit. Mm. That's the shit that makes you different. And so when the door does open, you're able to walk through it. You have a special relationship with Cypress Hill as opposed to you've worked with a ton of other rappers, but culturally. Uh, and Oh, for sure. You and Be Real on the smoke box, you guys just seem like yeah. best friends. Yeah, I mean, you know, getting to know B, Muggs, and Bobo, all those guys, you know, they're from here. These are our local heroes. We don't have many heroes in our community that we can be like, man, these motherfuckers grew up in Southgate, you know? And, and people might end up forgetting just because time sort of makes people forget about shit, but the, the fact that Cypress Hill were the first Hispanic rappers in the mm. mid, early 90s, I mean, that just says a lot. Yeah, it had their own style, and, mm. you know, Muggs moved over from... New York and moved to Southgate, which is borderline in South Central. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? <laughs> you know, Muggs had to fight everybody. And, you know, it, it, he's a character, man. But he is the the overseed, like, master of, of that whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. being able to mastermind. So I watch these guys do press. I watch them go and, and do interviews and how they moved. And they had managers and accountants. And so I started to mirror myself after that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So... You are, your mom says, you know, you are who you hang around. So being around people that are a little bit further from you, man, it's, it's, uh, it fires you up. That's so interesting because, like, the same way that you were looking at your friend who was doing murals or whatever, mm -hmm. now you're all of a sudden looking at Cypress Hill, but you're thinking, well, they're doing the music business and there's already a very established formula of how you make money off of music. Right. Tattooing is very new for that. Art in general, in, in a hip hop context, was sort of, it was new the idea of like really thinking of yourself as somebody yeah. who was really forming their business in the hip hop scene. Is that sort of a similar thing? You're, you're watching Cypress Hill and you're like, I could be this pro professional and organized and I can have these relationships. Yeah, when you see street guys do it, mm. it, it makes it, it dumbs it down to where you can understand it. Mm. Hearing Suits talk about it, it's hard to take in. But seeing the, the fellas do it, you're like, oh, shit, I could do this. So I mirrored them um, by going, say, I'll go to Japan. And I'll go to the northern part of Sendai, and I'll put snipes up on the, po on the poles that I was there. Uh -huh. And then I will go do press. I'll do any interview I can get my hands on and do it in Japan. And um, I would work my way down city by city till I end up in Osaka. Huh. And I'd stay there for like three months in Japan. Really? And uh, that's how I started to build my shit. And uh, I would do what they did. Press, interviews, anything I could do. Um, stickers out, merch. And started to try to step out of my body and say, if I was managing this artist, what would I do with them? Right. You know, Japan in particular stood out to you a lot though, because they have such an interesting history of how they view tattoos. I was in Japan and I tried to use the friggin' gym. They're like, no, nope. you look like a gangster. I'm like, do I? Okay. It's weird that they tell gangsters they can't go in somewhere. <laughs> I know. If I'm such a gangster, let me in. Shouldn't you be scared of me? <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to be scared of me, motherfucker. You know? I never really, that's just how Japan is. Yeah. It's uh, unspoken. They have their own saunas, their own gyms, mm. they go to their own shit that they own. Yeah. Um, for as taboo as it is, that country has been doing tattoos longer than electricity has been around. Mm. That's why they do it hand poke like that because they were doing you know, fucking tattoo machines. But were you finding people that were excited about your tattoos oh. in Japan? In Japan, I started going in 1992. Right. Doing murals on their lowriders. Nowadays, I'm sure you have a ton of interest, but back then, was it a little different? Back then, my friend came to me in 1992 and goes, Hey, Holmes, 
they want to fly you to Japan to paint a car. And I was like, what? You don't know Japan. anybody that ever been to Japan at that point, right? <laughs> yeah. And what does that have to do with low riding? And I was like, <laughs> nah, man, you got to understand they're into that shit. They look like homies, like essays. And some of them look like blood and crips. They go into a tanning booth and they s f cook in there and come out with fucking corn rolls on and jerry curls and shit you're like what the fuck and they were doing that shit mm -hmm. like thousands of them still to this day when i was in japan a couple of years ago of the, they were so excited these these dudes and lowriders pulled up mm -hmm. outside of the shop we were at they're like just like los angeles i'm like whatever you say yeah, yeah. like i ain't seen one of them in la you don't I don't see a lowrider in la unless you go out of your way to see it yeah these dudes are driving around in lowriders in japan every day every day all day i mean that's just it is that they're perfectionists you know what mm -hmm. i mean like don't underestimate the Japanese because when they obsess on something, they get it down. Mm. And they almost rescued the whole culture of lowriding in L.A. Really? Because they bought all these cars overpriced. Wow. You know, they paid double up for a rag Impala. And as a result, homies here were able to open up restoration shops and they were able to have all this work. Wow. So they really did, by imitating us, they ended up helping us. That's amazing. So... They're just so detailed, man. And we still go back over there. I'm doing a collab with Neighborhood really? Brand uh, where I'll drop those vans and like a whole capsule. Are there any other countries that in particular you have real strong relationships with in terms of doing work there and just the people? Sure. We go to Thailand every year. Okay. So Bangkok's a yearly trip and uh, the high society kids out there are all sleeved up, mm. going nuts in Lambos and fucking, it's crazy. They have these 13 story malls with. Rolls Royce dealerships, and then you walk outside and you're in a fucking slum. Right. So, but they're beautiful people, man. Them Thailand, being, Thailand's a little rough. Yeah, but it's not violent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're Buddhists and they're really, really just real safe there. Right. But uh, we started going there and um, we just got back from China. So Asia's real heavy. Mm. You know, Hong Kong coming, and uh, but we go to Canada, you know, we go to other places that really embrace hip hop. That's Australia amazing. and shit. Yeah. They love it for sure. Um, can we talk about when you did this tattoo on Eminem? Because that was that like a seismic shift in how well known you were? Because words can't express how big Eminem was at that time. <sighs> I mean, it was crazy, man. It was it was a a phenom rapper kid. I seen him perform before I knew who he was. Mm. And it was at um one of Bigger B's events in downtown. And we show up and M walked on stage and the whole crowd's like, ooh, you know, like, who's this? Fucking not a lot of white rappers then, probably. No, they were not. People were not hyped. And then five minutes into him rapping, the whole place was fucking quiet as fuck. Really? And uh, I ended up meeting through Cypress and Stevon, and uh, they had the same management, you know. And once I tattooed him, I no longer needed a portfolio. Back then, we used to have portfolios. Right. Where we had all of our shit and photographs of, in these books, and we'd send them to record labels. And you really didn't need to bring it around anymore just because the Eminem tattoo was so famous? He was just on so many covers of magazines, like like that. You yeah. know, with his fist, his arm out, bicep and, out. And he just did that. He didn't, like, go crazy and do the rest of his arm, so that thing really stood out. And little by little, he would come and get more, right. you know? And uh, it was a trip to see... Uh, someone that's a master of what he does and uh, they almost have a, a lightweight glow. You know what I'm saying? Like Nas or Beyonce or someone like that walks in. Like, oh, shit. And you had to you do know? it in a hurry because Eminem was about to go on a date? Eminem had a date with, uh, yeah. He had a date and he was like, I was like, you know, I'm doing your daughter's portrait, Holmes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no pressure and shit. <laughs> and I'm at a studio in New York, you know, which was above the original Supreme really? building. Wow. And, um, yeah, so, the, you know, it's always a precious situation. When I went into the 36 Chambers to Tattoo Method Man, everyone was there smoking, drinking, the lights, the chairs are, you know. Compare that to working in your studio with perfect lighting, your oh. exact equipment. Is it a completely different ballgame from your perspective? For sure. Mm. It, it, being on the road, you have to pack everything in Pelican cases. We got it polished now. We we got it down because mm. we've been doing it for 20 mm. years, but... In the beginning, in those days, it was a lot harder working with one little light in a studio and everyone's, um, it's like tattooing in a nightclub in a crowd, you know? <laughs> yeah. I've walked into Shoreline Mafia sessions and there's been two dudes doing tattoos and there's like 40 guys in there, a hundred blunts lit at the same time. And I'm just like, that's just, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing right there, my friend. 
Yeah, like you'll never walk in and see like an orthodontist surgeon <laughs> taking off of someone's mouth and everyone's <laughs> fucking smoking and shit. Yeah. You know? Or someone getting those old lady's tits done. Right. And how about just showing up the doctor's homeboy starts showing up? Hey, what's up, fool? What you doing? <laughs> oh shit, those look good. People drunk as hell. Cause that's how tattoo shops are. They confuse them for barber shops. Mm. And they want to come in here and tell me their life story and uh yeah, they, they like to hang out and bullshit. So I had to over the years, start narrowing that down mm. and streamlining that so I could get shit done. Yeah, definitely. That So when you look at your life these days, how you like to structure it? Like, you know, I'm sure you could be doing 80 hours of tattoos a week if you wanted to. How, how much do you bite off? What, where do you find your sweet spot at? Because I'm sure you don't, you're not doing the tattoos because you need an extra couple hundred bucks in your pocket. Right. You're doing it because it's an enjoyable part of your life. How do you schedule it? For sure. That, that's a job in itself. So you have to, uh, when I started watching M and, and 50 and all them when they were new and the, how they were moving, they told me, hey, man, you need a, you need a manager. You need some help. Mm. Like you're doing everything yourself. You're negotiating the shit. You're answering, you know, calls or email, back, and you're doing the tattoo. So you need to uh, let go of some of the bread and bring someone in. So that's when I think it started to change when I started to get some help. My guy Hunter, he's been here for 13 years now. Um he, you know, from England. So when they hear a call back from me, it's with the Queen's English. <laughs> so, you know, the price goes up. Right. That's a good point. But I had Smiley from White Fence answering the phone, but it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep the homies around and keep them employed if I can. You know what I mean? But Hunter's job is to be able to space all that out. So all you artists out there, eventually you're going to want to space out your artwork. So this much tattooing. We streamline that down a lot and only work pretty much on a lot of uh, repeat clients and choice new ones. Mm. And then I have to do illustrations. So I have to pause from that and start drawing, say, the Clippers artwork, mm. right, for logos and T-shirt graphics and apparel. Then from there, you're going to go and you have to do a painting. Mm. Christian Hosoi is doing a thing with Ruka, and I got to do a painting for that. And every day is like this for you, where it's just you're bouncing around. You, you're doing tattoos, you're doing art, you're doing a million different things, right? Yeah, and then you got to come and do an interview and be able to, like, break that shit down and have current projects going, like staying. Like, I just went back to China because I haven't been in China in 10 years. Mm. And I had to go reintroduce myself to a whole new generation of kids that are just learning about tattooing and hip-hop. right. So you have to you have to um, be strategic, but a lot of times too we do a lot of outreach. Right, we go into um, junior highs and, and high schools or bring kids to an event, and I tell them, you know, my formula, and I kind of dare them to do it, and tell them that hey, maybe if art's not your thing, installing car stereos or learn how to do body and paint. Do you feel like you get a lot out of that experience of having those real conversations with people? I do. I started doing it um, by mistake. My friends became art teachers. Ah. And they were like, hey, man, the kids will listen to you. Come over. You know, you got tattoos, they'll, they'll listen. And they, you know, they just want to ask me how much to fix their fucked up tattoos. <laughs> kids in junior high and shit. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to give them the fucking keys to the, to the game right here. And yeah. Like, well, how much to fix this? You know? But sometimes they say if one kid pays attention, did good, you know, mm. and sometimes the one kid's me. And as, as much as it's maybe not necessarily the most efficient use of your time, I feel like it's, it's important to do human shit like that, you know, just have a real human connection with some kid. Yeah. Can do a lot for your mind state. Especially when we do these type of, we have our jobs are kind of off of our imagination, our mm. passion, our, our detail, our, our the, we got it good, right? Yeah. So... In order to keep in my head, the only way I can keep this is by giving it away. Yeah. Right? So my old man's like that. I've been raised like that. Of, You know what? you got to fucking dream life, and you need to help others along the way if you can. I like that. The only way I'm going to keep this is by giving it away. That honestly, that just hit me. Because there's a lot of truth to that. Well, when you try to hoard it, when I tried to learn these old dinosaurs, these angry motherfuckers, they didn't want to give me nothing because mm. they thought I was going to use it against them and, and take their work and underbid them. Wrong, wrong picture of me. I was not, I was not my intention. But in a way, they helped me because they made me 
take apart an airbrush and put it back together mm. or figure out how a tattoo machine works. And, you know, the, you got to learn. So, but I'm not going to be there every day for these youngsters. I'm not going to give them my cell number. So this is it. Right. But I'm, I'm, hopefully I'm planting a seed that if they work hard, get the shit together, they can do it. Right. Because, I mean, you know, people inspired you. It's like you kind of, you owe it to other people to do that as well. I did get helped along the way. There mm. were people that took the time and they said, hey, Tune, you're fucking up, bro. Mm. Stay away from that that dark shit. And, uh, you know, I mean, also, I work for Hustler Magazine. I've done Jules Jordan's logos. Oh, I know Jules, yeah. You know, so uh, working for Hustler, I mirrored Larry Flint's limo. Really? I put uh, pussies hidden into orchids on the side of his limo. You know, there's this hotel that we go to for brunch sometimes, and Larry Flint, we can always just tell, because we see him in there, he's got a gold wheelchair, and then also he's got this big-ass car out front that says sure. Flint. But I don't, I don't, he doesn't bring the, the low rider out. Yeah, I mean, it was just a, a, like a Lincoln limo. Okay. But only he can get away with, like, life-size nude women <laughs> on, the, on the quarter panel of his car. <laughs> That's too funny. Um, when you... Look at who you, do you have a crazy waiting list in terms of people who want to get tattooed by you? Is that something you deal with? Yeah, it's uh, most professional artists have a waiting list, you know. If, you, if they don't, you know, watch out. But do you have an oppressive list that forces you to make a lot of tough choices because you have so many people that are trying to get tattooed by you? You probably got clients you've tattooed a million times who want to sure, come get new sure. stuff, but it's impossible because I'm a one man show, yeah. So, uh, half of our job is just trying to figure all that out uh -huh. on how to. How do you do that, but then work on an animation project that you want for your own shit? Tattooing you know is so I mean? time intensive. Yeah, and there's no shortcuts, and it's uh, it's very difficult. But uh, yeah, it, it's all about that. It's all about being able to be in different worlds. But then you're like, you got to design this shoe. You need to put your shoe hat, like your your, your sneaker head cap on, mm. and dive into that shit. And then staying relevant in different worlds is difficult. So what, what I try to do is just be me, right? And I got a 15-year-old kid, 14-year-old daughter. I'm watching them. I'm tripping on their shit, what music they're listening to. Right. You know, I'm 50 years old. My homeboys are complaining about modern-day hip-hop. I'm like, you old motherfuckers, man. You know how you sound complaining about fucking rock and, and rap music? Come right. on. But they're complaining more that music is shit. Mm. So I go, okay, are you trying to say that Kendrick Lamar is shit? Right. Like, well, no, no, not him. All right. What about Tiara Wack? Mm. Oh, she's she's dope. She's creative. That's dope. You know who she is. Yeah, you got to stay on top of this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Uh, Doja Cat. She's dope too. Right? I go to my daughter. I go, baby, what do you think about Doja Cat? She's like, Dad, I love that girl. I was like, I thought I was gonna put my daughter onto something. My shit. girlfriend just recently hit me with that. She's like, Doja Cat is so good. I love her. I'm like, oh, well, if my girlfriend knows about it, then it means it's starting to. Spread to the mainstream a little bit. I have news for everyone. Mm. These new art student kids are dope. Mm. They know about old school hip hop. They can paint the album cover, edit the video, sing, dance, act, and, and they're and they're dope on top of it. So really? interesting. It's this whole new wave, and and there's a whole new wave of young people doing classic soul. Right. Like the Sincere's, um, there's uh, K.P. Finnegan, there's uh, Mayor Hawthorne, there's um, Duran Jones. I just started getting tapped into some of the stuff, like new music that sounds like old school soul stuff. Yeah, I call it new vintage. Right. So it's like, sounds like the Delphonics in 1965. Yeah. But that shit came out like two weeks ago. That's nice. And you're like, oh, shit. Like this this is dope. So uh the Lake Siders, mm. kids from East LA that, that are dope and, and I gotta get into oldies. that. Let me ask you this. When you have something like a Drake or a OVO collab like where you're wearing right now, do you sort of end up doing the collabs that come your way? Do you sort of have a wish list of like this is the stuff I think is dope and I sort of reach out and try to make these collabs happen? How's that normally go? A lot of times the collabs they, they come to us. Mm. Um but I only want to work with people I already fuck with. Like if I already support your brand or would wear that shit, I'm down with that. So, you know, um, I fuck with Drake. I fuck with the music. I've been to Toronto. I see how that city moves. I'm like, I fuck with all that shit. 
So when it came time, I liked the way that uh, the apparel's made, cut and sew, you know, right quality. And uh, I fuck with it. So, and I was able to do what I wanted to do. That's really important that they let me do my shit. Mm. So, um, and you got to be careful with it, you know, like um, sometimes you do shit and it don't blow up. Like I've done Supreme designs 15 years ago. Really? Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm going to kill him. With, and, you know, it's like people didn't know what Supreme was. Mm. I was like, fuck. That's so funny that you, you got it a little too early. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was there, though, so I was like, I put my flag down before you motherfuckers. You can still shit. say you did it at the <laughs> end of the day, yeah. And I do holiday windows, like gold leaf the Supreme store window. Oh, really? Wow. Like, that is painstaking work. Really? And it's all done by hand, and it's done backwards, because you got to do it on the other side of the glass and do it reverse. When you get offered something like that, is there any temptation in your mind to, like, have, you know, a team help you do stuff, whether it's, like, on a mural or, or, or a tattoo or whatever? Like, if, if you're doing a tattoo and there's just a big wall of black shit you got to fill in, do you yeah. ever have an assistant come help you out? Well, I have apprentices, and I, I definitely have a team when I show up. Okay. So... When I show up to do a gold leaf window, um, I bring my assistant that has gone to school with Trey Tech where I went. I only went to one year of schooling, LA Trey Tech in 1988. And he went there in like 2008. But he's been trained the same way, so he'll definitely help me with, the, you know, half the grunt work on that right. shit. Right, okay. Uh, tattoos, I do them all myself, but they help me get the pattern ready, shrink this shit in Photoshop, size it up for the customer's arm. That now they're starting their shit. They're prepping the customer's arms. Mm. They're shedding, stepping up my station. So I just really have to step in and go. Do you love downtown LA? Part of you ever want to get out of there in terms of going to an area that might have more customers? Or no, I mean I don't do walk-ins, so I could basically I could be anywhere mm. and run the same thing. Uh, I actually moved out of downtown oh, okay. a couple of years ago, and it just started getting crazy gentrified. I mean. Everything was out of control. Like, right. It wasn't the same place. And a lot of the artists that uh, grew up there are leaving. You just can't afford it. You really? know what I'm saying? The studio I had for 3500 a month, it's 25000 a month. But oh, I'm, a, I'm a member at Soho House in downtown. So there's my office in downtown. Really? You just pull up there whenever you need to? I have a meeting there. and do shit, you know. And But I have a full-blown studio um, in L.A. Uh -huh. So, but it's super private. But I'm building a showroom in Santa Monica. So Santa Monica just lifted the ban on tattooing. They had a ban? Yeah. Whoa. I didn't for a know long that. time. What the fuck? Keep the riffraff out. Damn, I didn't know that. But now the riffraff are ball players and musicians. <laughs> like and, a millions. Yeah. Um, so it's, they've opened their mind, you know? Right. So that's my goal for 2020 is a, a new studio that people can go with take a picture in front of the gold. It's still private and shit, mm. appointment only, but we'll do drops out of there and make shit happen. At 50, do you feel as driven as you felt when you were 20? Oh, I definitely do. I mean, I don't know. I feel the same way. As, I'm, like Out of my eyes, I feel the same age as these youngsters. You mm. know what I mean? I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, shit, it's me. But I feel like I'm barely scraped the foam off the latte. Like this shit is so wide open. Mm. We live in a, a place where if you decide to make a certain type of company, you can do it. Right. You know, we went to India last year and we like came back on some super grateful shit, <laughs> humble shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, with hard work, you, you could do everything. And I'm just starting over in other things like animation, right? Mm. I just got, uh, I did something for DJ AM's documentary. Really? And um, R.I.P. And I did something for that doc. And I'm working on these other projects. I can't really say right now, but I'll, I'll come back and tell you about them later. But, yeah, I'm starting over again, you know, um, in that world. And um, doing, it always seems like we're, we're starting over. But, like, tattooing and stuff like that, even though we got it down, now you, you're, you're making supplies. You're doing signature machines. Oh, really? You do all that now, too? Yeah, the product wow. world is is out of out of control with that stuff. Really interesting. Yeah, that's dope. Eventually, everything will be branded. Mm. You know, I just did a collab with Stance, and I did my own boxers. Okay. So it's like I've done an axe body wash. You did that as well. With, wow. Yeah, with P Rod. So it's like 
eventually our our shampoo, our toothbrush, boxers, everything about our life, one of us will be in the design room, mm. even I've, if we don't own the corporation. Did you ever get burnt in one of those situations where you felt like a company didn't really do you right and sort of took your name and did some stupid shit that you weren't cool with? I mean, I've worked with some real shitty people, if that's what you're asking. Mm. <laughs> Not so much the big boys, because they can get sued, right? right? So I haven't had to sue none of them, but... I've, it's the smaller guys you got to watch out for. It's the guy you meet at the club or the coffee bean that's bragging, I can do this, I know this guy. And a lot of times they're full of shit mm. and they're thieves. And they'll, you know, um, you got to watch out for all those. So it's on the come up. Nowadays, I'm going in with a lawyer and a manager. You know what you're doing. Contracts now, are being signed. I mean, it's pretty, you know, deep nowadays. But when the 20 years I wasn't there, um, I had to do a lot of the stuff on my own and got burned sometimes. Sometimes you would get stupid overpaid and then someone else would dodge you for the money. So mm. it all kind of works out in the end. Do you, when if you were to be looking at somebody, you know, 20, 22 year old kid or whatever, and he's just started getting going in the game, he reminds you of you. What would be your way to advise him to get into the game? Because nowadays it's like you could do the apprenticeship thing at a tattoo shop. Mm -hmm. You could also probably start making YouTube videos of you drawing or painting and create a fucking following on your own. Like, what what, what kind of advice do you give? You have to do everything. Mm. So you have to make a little channel for yourself where you're drawing and sketching on YouTube, edit that shit yourself, post it, uh, go out there, be at the right events, find out, hey, man, there's a video shoot over here. I'm going to go to my friend's uh, PA on. I'm going to go and help out. Um Hang, hang around other artists, you know what I'm saying? Um, and start at the very bottom. Go to a tattoo shop, you got a tattoo, go get a tattoo. You like the way, the, the vibe of that shop? Hey, man, if you ever need any help, you need the fucking floor swept, I know your bathroom's looking a little crazy, I can help out with that shit. That's how I got my apprentices. They, they were tattoo customers or clients, mm. and they ended up saying, hey, how could I be you know, of use? And next thing you know, they're going to fucking dinner with you. So it's like, if you can at least get yourself into the position to start at the bottom and work your way up, that's the way in. Mm. See, some people look at it wrong. Oh, man, I'm not going to fucking take orders from no motherfucker. You can take an order from someone. Mm -hmm. It better be some cool motherfucker where at least they're playing music that you like. And like, you got to want to do it for free. Mm. You're going to do it for free for a long ass time. And just to get your name out there and just to be in the scene. Just to build a reputation, be known as somebody that's easy to work with, good yeah. to work with, all of a sudden. And and then if those original people that you've been working with, like maybe somebody else is going to take notice and maybe they're not treating you right, but you got a nice reputation now. Mm -hmm. You're meeting more and more people. Maybe somebody's going to offer you a job. Somebody's going to, you know. That's how it stacks up on top of each other. Mm. It's small successes that you do on the daily that stack on top of each other that equal something big a year from now. Mm. Same thing with, with fucking up. Failing to call someone back. Failing to pay someone back you owe money to. Failing to do this. All that shit stacks up and then you get hit over the head with like failure. Mm. So I don't want to get too deep, but if you um, you surround yourself by that shit, you're going to get burned. That's for damn sure. But how you act when you get burned usually dictates on where you're going to go. Mm. In other words, if you go into a ball and like, fuck all these motherfuckers, everyone's out to get me, I can't catch a break, everything's fucked up, you're going to be there. If Ultimately, it's all about survival and people end up respecting the people who actually are able to be around for a yes. long time without melting down and yes. fucking it up. Uh-huh. And how you perceive what happens. Mm. You, you're not in control of people, places, or things. All your control over is how you feel about it. Mm. I, I, there's people I can think of who even within the last couple of months that we know who maybe they did get burned in a bad situation, but then they acted like a bitch about it and they were all crying about it on social media. And I might still kind of feel bad for them that they got burned in the situation. But trust me, we're laughing at you when we're just sitting here chatting because the truth is, it's like to do, you know, you're showing too much emotion. You're, you're putting your shit too much out there on blast. People aren't going to trust you if you're just out here acting like that emotionally, you know, that's the hard part. Now everything's filmed. Oh <laughs> shit. Yeah. You got a camera on everything. Everyone's got a camera phone. They're busting out. 
I can't even go to a concert without everyone with their phone up. Mm -hmm. so it's that part is it's bad. Who's gonna watch those videos? Right. You know, you're there. Are you, you know, are you gonna go home and watch that shit? It's yeah. just crazy. I, man, because uh, the other day I was watching a video of a uh, Spider Loke pulling up to to chat with the game and and Snoop Dogg and maybe two thousand like yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah. or actually no it was, it was G Unit era so it was like two thousand three four and. I'm watching it and I'm just watching. It. I'm thinking, man, this should look crazy. And then I remembered it looks crazy because you got all these famous motherfuckers in the room and there's nobody filming. There's nobody who's got yeah. their phones out. All that got missed. And that looks crazy. Yeah. That's shocking to me now to see that on camera. It's shocking. Things have uh, really changed just from that, from 2000. Mm. 2000 was a great time, man. I mean, there was like, that was maybe the Murder Inc. era. And we were just starting to put rims on cars. Mm. Like oh, that shit became like really available, available. And uh, you know, three one zero mortaring, all that type of shit. Man, LA was was good, man. Mm. So, but we still bust out lowriders. You know, you'll see us on Hollywood Boulevard on a random oh, yeah. Saturday or Friday night. Yeah, the cops these days are much more chill about that shit. They are about lowriders. Yeah. Really, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Hip hop cops, you know, they know the lyrics to fucking dope man and shit. <laughs> now, when you get in trouble for like skateboarding or BMX, the cops always or the the security guard always says the same thing. They always say, "Listen, man, I used to skate. I know what it is. I know it's cool, but you can't do this here." It was just so weird because like late nineties, getting in trouble for BMX and skateboarding, they, they didn't understand. So they'd be like, "Fuck you, get out of here," you know. Yeah. Now everybody has much more of a cultural perspective of like more youth culture. Yeah, your family member, you know, someone that, that you like. You, does that you know shit. who Tony Hawk is? Then don't yell at me for skating this rail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Facts. Okay, so you've got obviously a million projects going on right now, but what's the stuff that gets you genuinely excited? What's really making you? Well, I'm going to do this uh, radio station with Snoop Dogg. Really? Because I've been doing uh, Classic Soul on Sundays for about 10 years. I call it Soul Sundays. Mm -hmm. And I spell it like an ice cream sundae. Nice. And uh, it's something I just started to do to kind of share uh, the soundtrack to my art. You know what I mean? Uh, the temperies, the stylistics, the dynamic superiors, the whatnots, cameo, you know, Marvin Gaye, mm. Sam Cooke. You know, the, from the classics to like crazy hard to find. And uh, I just started putting it and sharing it. And was consistent with that. Never missed a Sunday. Really? Yeah, and then, that, that's the way to do it. Yeah, that's just like what you're doing right here. You know, I wasn't getting, at that time, I'm not getting nothing for it, really. You know, I still, now I just do it because I love it. But uh, now through Instagram, it starts to build up and build up. And if you don't miss and you're consistent, people will start to follow and trip out on it. Yeah. But now it's going to go to like a two-hour show and uh, play funk, some Blue-Eyed Soul, some uh, Chicano soul, um, hard to finds to, you'd be surprised a lot of kids don't know I'm your puppet or they don't know I heard it through the grapevine or like shit that we, is very common to us. I was just listening, I heard it through the grapevine uh, in Hawaii a couple of days ago, me and my girl were driving along the coast and I fucking fired up the Marvin Gaye <laughs> Essentials uh, playlist on Apple Music and we were, we were getting crazy. And there's so many good documentaries too mm. right now. Uh, Netflix, no, Showtime has one on on Hitsville, okay, Motown. I'm about to start watching this Wu Tang series on uh, yeah. on HBO or whatever. It's dope. Yeah, I watched one of them. It's really good. I've been hearing good things, which is surprising to me because I was kind of expecting to not hear great things. So yeah. now that I'm hearing good things, I'm extra excited. Yeah, it, it is really good. I mean, I've been watching Mindhunter. I like. Uh, oh, you like that? I like serial killers. I'm a couple shit. episodes in. I'm still trying to get hooked on it. Yeah, I had to watch it all the way through and then rewatch it with really? my wife. And the second time through. You You've know, seen the show Succession? I haven't seen Oof. that. Check it out. Fire. HBO. Okay. About this like really rich media organization family that the father is like dying and there's this whole war for the kids to take over the company and it's just fucking it's insane. Um, when you look at me, what kind of tattoo do you imagine yourself doing on me if that were to ever happen? You're running out of room, man. I got the thighs. You know, I got my whole back. I'm sure you don't back, want to bite that off. Back piece is, is generally the, you know, when I was going to tattoo 50, um, he came to me to get something on his arm. Really? And I said, you know what, bro, no no disrespect, but I just, I want to do your back. You homies. did the south side thing on his back? Yeah. Really? Wow, I did not know that. That's so tight. For sure. I used it for like the campaign for his Yeah, uh, for, for the his movie. Album. 
the movie too, right? The Tattoo Who Kid. He had the picture of him with the baby, and they they yeah. showed him from behind, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Um, who Kid did a mixtape too? That was crazy with Fifties back on there. Right. Did that he end up getting all that removed? Uh his sleeves. Just the sleeves. Okay. Yeah, he didn't for movies take his or back something. Piece off. Yeah. Okay. Because those ones he got as a kid, like as a youngster before he got money, you know? Right. I always thought black dudes couldn't get tattoos removed before he did it. Yeah, the, the lasering equipment now is is top shelf. It I used mean. to be like that, right? Where it's like the, the laser just gets rid of the dark stuff. So if you're black, it's not going to be able to tell what's dark and what's your skin or something? Well, no, it's more about the keloid maybe, that the oh. keloid was already damaged skin. Okay. And it shows more on darker skin. Uh. So a lot of that comes with tattooing is knowing how to how deep to go, how much to work the skin uh, has a lot to do with it i meant to ask you this before but back in the day when you were saying like when black dudes first started getting tattooed yeah. for the first time was that like a really unique challenge to you at the time working with a completely different skin color or is it, is it kind of the same thing well everyone's human right everyone has flesh the same like you but if you culturally if you go to japan and like say a girl in japan like milky bright white skin right and then one no of my hair. homeboys that's a construction Mexican kid, you know, might, you know, he's in the sun all day, he might have leather skin. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of it has to do maybe to the person's diet or how much they're getting sun beat. Right. But yeah, darker skin's a little more of a challenge. But uh, I did push a T, you know what I'm saying? Oh, that's tight. Tyson Beckford, they got ink, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah, that's a pretty good. If, if you're going to cite a couple of black references, that's about as good as it gets. Push a T and Tyson Beckford, that's excellence. You guys are dope. Yeah, no lies. Oh, man, I'm so honored, honestly. You haven't done a lot of like long-form interviews in a few years, huh? I haven't. When I was looking at your stuff on YouTube, it was primarily like 2013, 2014. So yeah. You kind of fell back on the media since then, huh? Yeah, we do here and there. You know, like I did something with Vice a couple times. Mm. Um, we'll have a lot of out-of-the-country stuff, you know, foreign stuff. Um, but, yeah, we try to hold back a little bit. I'm working on a, a documentary of 25 years of footage on me tattooing. Wow. And it's directed by Stevan Orio. That's going to be huge. Are you so, just is the idea to produce it and then try to figure out who you're gonna try to pitch it to in terms yeah, of the streaming services and stuff? We're pretty much clear on one of the one of the big guys is gonna get it, you know. That could if you had that come out on big Netflix documentary about your whole career and stuff, yeah. that could be another huge wave for you. That would be amazing. Yeah, it, it educates a lot of people that maybe has seen this stuff or heard many but don't know maybe yeah. what I look like or you know. My name goes farther than what people you know, to hear my name that think Six foot tall. Do you have that a lot where like somebody might be talking for a little bit and then they realize you're Mr. Cartoon? Yeah, or they don't figure it out. <laughs> and they just tell me that they got an appointment and shit. I'm like, oh, that's good, Holmes. That's good. That's kind of dope, though, to have the name hold so much weight that it's even bigger than just your face. For sure. I'd much rather people know my name and my art over me. Mm. Yeah. That's why I like animation. That's why you're, you've gone so far as an artist. Because a lot of people at some point would have tried to make it more about their pretty little face talking mm. on camera. You you really care about the art, you know? Yeah, you uh, the mis mystery fact sometimes is is better mm. uh, to be seen but not noticed. That way, you know, but stay in there, stay in the pocket. Mm -hmm. I've been watching this Bobby Caldwell video from 1978. If anybody has YouTube up, what's that? Who's he? Uh, he's a blue eyed uh, soul singer. Okay, and. Uh, I just trip out on going some of those old videos. I know it's kind of a segue right there, but YouTube, you can look up all these crazy old soul videos and shit and watch a, a gang of shit. I'm all I look at. It seems like like your feed came up yeah. on mine, and I, I recognize the logo in the Dame Dash interview and all uh -huh. that shit. So it's crazy, like, being able to see your shit and then uh, – Rico Nasty. <laughs> Man, you know all the chicks. Right? That's tight. <laughs> you, you, I don't think anybody in a million years could have expected Mr. Cartoon to name drop Tierra Whack and Rico Nasty. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing right there. I'm on it, man. Shit. I watch my kids, man. You know, live through them. How old are they now? 13, 14, 15, and 25. Oh, so they're heavy in the hip hop, huh? Yeah, like my son's like, Dad, how about Twister? Do you like Twister? I was like, Twister? <laughs> I was like, damn, son, Twister. that's good. That's good. I go, listen to Public Enemy, man. Listen to this. Listen to uh, Schooly D. And my son's obsessed with uh, old school hip hop. 
And he was that's the model amazing. for the OVO shoot. Really? So if you see my little OVO shit, he's the kid. In oh, that's amazing. Yeah, because I feel like nowadays it's like kind of rare that I meet kids who, but certain old school stuff, like you mm. feel like there's a lot of a uh, uh, tribe called Quest Love, the younger generation, <laughs> which is kind of interesting to me because, yeah, they were popular yeah. when I was young and they were really coming out, but it's it's strange to see them hold much more weight than a lot of artists who were more popular than them mm. at the time. Because it was the first time that we heard hippie rap, mm -hmm. you know, really like not breaking the common tough guy, uh, hardcore view of a rapper. Yeah. These motherfuckers were talking about daisies and Jimmy hats and shit. We were like, what? <laughs> that shit's tight. Yeah. And that's what I think Cypress Hill broke through mm -hmm. because they had their own style and they made people like feel the certain vibe, like weed vibe. And then the... The, the lyrics were there and the beats were crazy and dark and it, it was a good time to be alive and all that Cypress Hill definitely like let a lot of people know what weed was all about before yeah. they ever smoked weed oh for sure you know and even like the loonies putting their shit like taking just a piece of a Cypress song and yeah. making their own shit and like look at Snoop right now man you, fucking, you gotta get Snoop on here that's what I'm dying to make happen yeah yeah, he uh, just had uh, D Magic Don Juan. Oh, that's <laughs> I'm, I'm getting all his friends in here. Yeah, he's pimping. <laughs> that dude, he's smoking a blunt out his nose. His OG. Mind blown. That green Cadillac. He said that he was just never going to let a blunt touch his lips again. I don't know why the nose is any better. I don't know how. I mean, the blunts were, were a New York thing. You know what I'm saying? And West Coast always had zigzags. And mm. um, I'm not sure how that creeped over. Because smoking on the... Um, Cigar paper always seems a little bit... It's a little abrasive. Harsh, you know what I'm saying? But now everybody's on the backwoods. What about you? No. Papers? Zigzag zone. Yeah, oh. papers. Well, they're raws now, right? No, it's raws. Organic I, I, raw. I bought some zigzags when I was just in Hawaii, and, you know, rolling with the white paper like it's that... Over. It looks a little weird compared to the raws, yeah. The filters, be real, has glass filters. You can Cadillac one right now, you know what I mean? Can you smoke a bunch of weed and then do a tattoo? It's all good? You know... Stuff is like you want to relax, but uh, it's good to be really focused mm. when you work, you know? I feel like I've smoked enough weed that I can do most of the things that I need to be really focused for while yeah. I now. It depends on the client. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if it's Barack Obama, Barack Obama sober? might just, yeah, kind of like a cool glass of wine with him or some shit. Right. You know what you I'm saying? Barry. <laughs> That'll do it. Mr. Cartoon, it's been a huge honor having you yeah, on the podcast, thank man. You, bro. Appreciate, Appreciate it for you, real. Man. Everybody out there, hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed this. It was honestly a huge honor for us. And I feel like a lot of kids out there are going to get a lot out of this. Hell yeah. Some good, good life advice spewed out. Uh, no Jumper, Mr. Cartoon, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, and subscribe. Hit up nojumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate every single one of you guys. Thanks. That's right.